ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, hello from the German house in New York, and welcome to Feelings Over Facts, a new look at language and political psychology. I'm Eva Bosbach, Executive Director of the North America Office of the University of Cologne. Our university is located in Germany, in the beautiful city of Cologne, which you might know for its famous Gothic Cathedral. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to our third Transatlantic Tandem Talk, part of the series held on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of our North America office here in New York. Today's Tandem Talk is about a topic that in some ways affects us all. Perhaps in a conversation about the current COVID-19 pandemic, our planet's climate or the political parties and candidates, you yourself experienced a challenging situation when a dialogue suddenly seems impossible because the gap between the two perspectives just seems too strong and endangers the relationship. If we could learn to talk in a way that helps us bridge political and other divides and be able to found common ground in the right language and framing, it would be a big step towards peace and mutual understanding in our society of tomorrow. This topic also ties very well into our mission here at the North America Office, which is to foster transatlantic relations in science and education. If you missed our first two transatlantic tandem talks on Black Lives Matter and plant sciences and food security, you can watch the recordings on the University of Cologne's New York Office website. This will be our last tandem talk before the summer, and we hope to see you again for more in the fall. This event and the series would not be possible without the support of our partners, the German Center for Research and Innovation, the VIH New York. Thank you, Katrin, Ben, Julia, Jared, and Sun Casey. Thank you to Anna from our office, and thank you to all our other partners, the America House Nordrhein-Westfalen, the German Consulate General New York, the German Academic Exchange Center Service, I'm sorry, the AD New York, Deutsches Haus at NYU, 1014 Space for Ideas, the Goethe Institute New York, the German Embassy in Washington, D.C., Wunderbar Together, and last but not least, the German Research Foundation, DFK. Lastly, before I hand over to Dana Kolischow, Program Coordinator at the DFK North America Office, I want to thank the DFK for funding the clusters of excellence in Germany, including four at the University of Cologne, one of them being eContribute Markets and Public Policy, from which our speaker is coming today. A joint initiative at the Universities of Bonn and Cologne, as well as the Behavior and Inequality Research Institute and the Max Planck Institute of Research for Research on Collective Goods, eContribute is the only cluster of excellence in Germany in economics and related disciplines. It brings together 130 outstanding researchers from economics, management, psychology, political science, and law, including our speaker today, Professor Joris Lamas, together with his US colleague, Professor Matthew Baldwin. Thank you all for joining us today. Dana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eva. Hi, everyone. I'm Dana Kalishaw, and I'm here today representing the German Research Foundation, or Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft. The GFG, as we abbreviate it, corresponds to the National Science Foundation in the US. We offer funding to Germany-based research projects researchers in any field of science and the humanities to pursue research projects of their own choosing. Our organization celebrated its 100th anniversary last year. Historically, we've been very proud to contribute to the fact that the average quality of German science is very high. On the contrary, the U.S. historically has focused more on a few universities, but outstanding ones. So in the beginning of the new millennium, the builders of German science policy looked for a way to combine these two approaches and get the best of both worlds, finally arriving at the so-called excellent strategy of the German federal and state governments. One part of this several-pronged strategy is the clusters of excellence. Clusters of excellence stand for project-based funding in internationally competitive fields of research at universities or university consortia. Every year, the GFG spends a, a total of approximately 385 million euros for clusters of excellence. For the last round of applications in 2018, the Excellence Commission funded 57 new clusters of excellence. Each of those clusters is funded by an average of 7 million euros for a period of seven years. 
One of these clusters is, as Ava mentioned, the Cluster of Excellence eContribute at the University of Cologne. I'm thrilled to listen to one of the PIs of this cluster, Professor Johannes Lamas, and his U.S. partner, Matt Baldwin, at the University of Florida, as they tell us about language and political divides, a subject that gets right to the heart of challenges we face in the U.S., and not, not just here, today. Thank you for joining us. And the floor now goes to Dr. Benjamin Becker, Managing Director at the America House Nordrhein-Westfalen e.V. Yeah, dear Eva, dear colleagues, dear guests of all participating organizations. Uh, yes, I'm, I represent American House NRW today, but I'm also a proud alum of the University of Cologne. So in my dual capacity, congratulations to the North America office's 10th anniversary and to this wonderful series of transatlantic tandem talks. But the extremely high sign-up numbers for today speak for the series, speak for its actors in various respects, and certainly for the very timely topic. If you don't know America House NRW yet, we can now change this. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity, and that was positive framing, by the way. America House NRW is a transatlantic NGO located in uh, North Rhine Westphalia in Germany. We have over 50 events that we host each year on politics, on culture, on business, and on educational topics. Now, among these in the past year and, and years have been fact checking, polarized societies. We've talked about positive uh, visions for the future of transatlantic relations. And in many cases, we've worked together with partners such as the University of Cologne or the Goethe Institute through Wunderbar Together, for example. You'll find more information online and you are most warmly invited to join our programs in person in NRW, Germany, or virtually. Now I wish us all an insightful discussion full of facts and positive feelings, which, by the way, would be my optimistic vision for the future. On the one hand, sincere, uh, sincere uh, fact-based politics, yet communicated with empathy and passion. I'll leave it at that and hand back the virtual mic to Dr. Eva Bosbach. Thank you, Eva. Thanks, everyone. I look forward. Thank you very much, Benjamin. Facts and positive feelings. I think this is great. It is now my pleasure to give the floor to our moderator today, Dr. Katrin Di Paola, Program Manager at the DVIH New York. Thanks a lot, and I feel very positive already after this, and also seeing all of you uh, joining us from both sides of the Atlantic. Thank you very much for being here, and it's fantastic that you invite us to your homes, to your offices, wherever you're from. And I also promise, of course, that we'll be in time for the kickoff of the next soccer match, for sure. I have to say that whenever Germany's playing and we have an event, so we'll make sure that that happens. But before, of course, I want to thank you, Eva, also again for, for putting together this um, amazing transatlantic tandem uh, talk. We've done a few together by now, and they've all been very outstanding. And this is, this is an amazing series for all of us. And looking at the logos, I mean, you have all the partners together um, that are trying to promote the, the transatlantic research and innovation landscape here in the United States. So thank you very much for that. It's a pleasure meeting you, Ben. Uh, it's fantastic seeing you in sort of virtual person here as well. And Dana, of course, is always wonderful working with the DFG as well. So my name is Catherine, as Eva said before, and I'm the program, uh, I'm heading the program here at the German Center for Research and Innovation. And as I do with most of our political events that we have, I'd like to do uh, issue a little disclaimer here. So this is a, a fantastic uh, event. And, um, but we also want to stress that we're a neutral institution and that all the viewpoints that are being portrayed here are not necessarily the, the viewpoints of the of the organization we're just here to foster the dialogue and are very happy to do so we have all become as dana said more and more sensitive towards language use and also abuse i would say rather debate of factual representation and opinion making and fact is from my point of view that it's really difficult to separate feelings from facts as our presenters actually um, have put in there in their headline here, even if the facts seem scientifically neutral. And I want to give you an example. If you take uh, precipitation numbers, for example, depending on your cultural and geographical background, they can be perceived as either a devastating catastrophe or simply normal rainfall during certain seasons. Let's look at, at the monsoon numbers, for example. If you live in a monsoon area, a lot of rain might be normal to you, but in the news in Germany, you might read from a journalist who thinks they're extremely devastating, catastrophic to everybody who has exper has, is experiencing them. So now take that very simple sort of approach and, and put it into a political con uh, context, it becomes really, really difficult, right? It becomes very tough when we enter political beliefs 
and the widening gap, of course, particularly in the US, as you can see right now, but also in countries like Germany. And, uh, you know, we have an election coming up and possibly a new government in the fall, and the discussions haven't been quite easy in our uh, political landscape and cultural landscape as well. Language, we all know that, plays a very important role in framing of viewpoints. But how exactly is framing um, is working to either cater to a more conservative or more liberal point of view, how we can have an understanding for the different perspectives and also help to overcome differences, differences and also if it's really possible to communicate effectively with audience across the political spectrum. This is something that uh, Jos Lammers and Matthew Baldwin have uh, spent a lot of time with and conducted a lot of research with, and they will talk about that to us today. Um, I'm very happy to introduce the speakers to you briefly. We will then hear from them and, and see their presentation followed by a Q&A session. While we're in process and, and uh, with the event, please stay muted if you can so we avoid any background noises. And then you can unmute yourself during the Q&A session when you're being called on if, or if you put a cue in the, uh, in the chat to ask a question. But let me introduce the presenters to you. So we have Joris Lammers. Joris, if you want to go even to the camera. <laughs> He's a social psychologist based at the University of Cologne, and he's also the chair of the research group in political psychology. And his research focuses on social power, moral psychology, and sexism, sexism and gender. He studies behavioral foundations of the political economy as an investigator of the cluster of excellence. He contributes at the University of Cologne. We just heard about that. Then we have Matthew. Matthew, same, same game. Yes, thank you. He's a social quantitative scientist based at the University of Florida. As a member of the research faculty in psychology, he studies how basic mental processes shape the self and society and looks at authenticity, nostalgia, and politics using big data to uncover broad social patterns. He completed the DFG postdoctoral research at the University of Cologne. And with that, I'm going to leave it to you, gentlemen, to take over the virtual floor. Thank you. Great, cool. Uh, yeah, so again, thanks everyone for being here. Um, this is a topic that yours and I have been working on for uh, many years now, and uh, we're still very passionate about it. Very excited to be able to share with you our, our data, our research, and also to get feedback, because of course, um, that conversation is what drives us and what helps us uh, move forward and progress with this. Um, so just to get started, uh, we'd like to start with a little activity or demonstration. Uh, maybe to put you in the mindset of maybe what our participants go, th go through when we conduct these studies. So um, imagine that there's a organization that's um, creating a campaign to try to get people to wear masks during a pandemic. Uh, maybe we're all familiar with something like this recently, but imagine that they're testing two different campaign slogans. So on the left, you see one version of this campaign that says wearing face masks, it's our tradition. On the right, you see another version of this campaign, wearing face masks toward a new future. So just take a moment to look at these two versions of the campaign, and you should see on your screen a poll where you can indicate which of these versions of the campaign you like better, which one sort of intuitively feels um, good for you, makes more sense to you, something that would appeal to you more. And you can um, select on the poll which one, and um, we will sort of return to this idea later on in the talk. Note that your response to this is totally anonymous. We will uh, sort of show like an aggregate of participants' responses here. So I'll just leave it up to Yoris to decide when to stop the poll and um, after that's finished, Iris will um, take us into some introductions on sort of the issue we see um, right now with political polarization. Ja, komm mal her, weil ich habe meine Kamera einfach zugemacht, damit man das mal sieht. Just make sure that everybody stays unmuted. <laughs> Not unmuted, muted, sorry. Das ist doch nicht.
I will just leave this open for a for a more for a minute or so more while I continue. Um, I think people can think in the background um, and uh, decide while I continue. Um, so my name is Joris Lamas from Cologne, um, and um, so so this this research uh, was done against a background of um, of this uh, sort of fact. Uh, so it, what you see here is uh, distribution of uh, in American data the distribution of uh, House candidates in the U.S. and their um, basically um, how ideological towards the left or liberal or towards the right conservative they have been um, they have been in their in their in their politics and the voting. And what you see is a very steady um, march towards the two extremes, uh, an increasing polarization, right? And so liberals, Democrats have become more liberal and Republicans have become more conservative over time. Um, that's not a, that's not in every country the case. Uh, in, in some, in many countries, there's no, no polarization taking place. In some countries, even the opposite. But in the US, you see a clear uh, pattern that, uh, that parties have drifted apart and politicians have drifted apart. And that's also by itself not necessarily a, Bad thing. Um, if politicians would all be identical in their in their position, that would of course be a very uh, big problem because we couldn't distinguish them, right? So it's it's good that politicians are somewhat uh, different in their ideology, but they should also not be too different. They should also be able to to find uh, at least opportunities to uh, to find uh, um, agreement, right? Because I mean that's that's the whole idea, I guess, of, of politics, right? That politicians. Have different opinions, um, but are also able in in parliament or wherever to to talk about these problems and find common ground. Because in the end, like if politicians are, are so strongly opposed that they never find common ground, then you end up in a situation where, um, well, big political uh, decisions are basically uh, impossible. Decisions that that require super majorities or so become impossible, and also. Um, uh, it erodes essentially the the opportunity to uh, to control the executive, right? If 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 one side of the parliament always agrees with uh, with the government because of their shared political identity, and the other always disagrees, then it essentially becomes um, uh, it undercuts its function, right? And so polarization at uh, at the political level, if it's too strong, is uh, is a problem. So um, you, you'll see this uh, sort of moving slide here as I'm explaining that this polarization um, doesn't occur only at the level of our elected officials, but we see this happening in the general public too, in the electorate um, with, with voters from the general population. Um, so here we see um, sort of distributions of answers to social surveys over the last several years conducted by Pew, um, maybe 10,000 Americans or so. Over time, and you can see that that uh, responses to what are typically sort of opposing viewpoints on various social political issues. For example, good diplomacy is the best way to ensure peace, which is a sort of left leaning idea, or the best way to ensure peace is through military strength, maybe a sort of conservative idea. Um, over time, um, these positions have become more extremely left and right. So there's less and less common ground, um, less and less sort of nuanced views on on these uh, sort of two sides of the coin um, over time. So this is happening both in the public and with our elected officials. Um, and we think this is definitely a problem. So I think it's a good thing that in the public discourse, we're um, sort of focused on these differences. And even in psychological science and political science, we're interested in understanding where these differences come from. But if you take this um, sort of last slide here, um, and take a look at that middle ground, there's, there actually is sort of a considerable overlap still, even at our sort of most polarized place, there may be a sense that there is some common ground. And if the language is always focused on differences, we might miss sort of an opportunity to also better understand our similarities or better understand what it is that can bring um, people together. Um, so I think that Joris and I sort of became interested in this um, purple zone uh, in the, in the in the figure there um, to try to figure out you know okay there are people clearly still sort of sitting on the same page or um, not talking past one another um, so if that's the case we want to know kind of what what we can do um, to better understand that uh, that common ground um, so that's sort of where um, where this research kind of jumped off from 
um, sort of a, a, a desire to understand those similarities. So I think now yours is going to explain a little bit of his background, then I'll explain a little bit of mine, and then we'll sort of get into our research. Yeah. So, um, so as a background, I'm originally a political scientist, and so I I've, I've been trained in in um, and an understanding of political ideology, and I've always been interested in, uh, in particularly in the ideology of, of political conservatism, um, and in particular. Um, what I was interest, interested in is this idea of, of conservatism and and um, and um, what drives conservative conservative ideology essentially. So, one of the earliest um, conservative ideologists, or so, um, um, if 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 you go back to to like the nineteenth century um, or even earlier, like Edmund Burke um, had this idea that you know. Like speaking uh, about the French Revolution and thinking about the French Revolution, he had this idea: yeah, like change or so is by itself good, but ch but change must always respect tradition, right? And and grow from from like um, from tradition, right? And so sort of make very radical changes or so is is undesirable. And so, a central idea in what what Russell Kirk, for example, calls the conservative mind is a sort of focus and respect for tradition. And so I've I've had this this um, his research interest in uh, in in understanding sort of the role that the past plays in uh, conservative thinking, and this sort of connects also with this idea that um, ideology is not just only a set of of political ideas, and so it, but it's also this sort of like ideological ideas about like where where a country should head towards or uh, what is a good policy uh, could be seen as as in a way as a sort of like a ideological superstructure and this ideological superstructure from a psychological perspective always builds on a sort of substructure on a on a on a large um largely hidden perhaps psychological base um and um our my idea was like could it be that that conservatives are sort of a sort of have this sort of psychological the psychological base the sort of psychological focus that's more strongly on the on the past and uh, yeah, Edmund Burke uh, wrote about this. He, he has this, this, this famous quote that the spirit of innovation is generally the result of a selfish temper. People will not look forward to posterity who never look backward to their ancestors, right? So there's always a sort of respect for the past. And so with this, with this focus on the past, um, uh, Matt and me met, well, Matt came to Cologne. Uh, in a, a DFG, in a German uh, research unit, uh, sorry, in a, in a research unit uh, funded by the DFG, and uh, we had this very interesting exchange, uh, Matt. Yeah, right, right. Thanks. So, so I uh, am a social psychologist by training, um, and as a graduate student in Kansas, um, I got interested in the emotion of nostalgia. So I was really interested in. Um, why, why people feel nostalgic and what sort of functions it serves uh, for people. And this was sort of generally related to my interest in how people compare themselves over time. So, um, you know, one of the ways we learn about who we are and what's important to us is by comparing who we are today to who we were in the past. So um, this interest of mine really set me up nicely to to join the research unit. So the, the DFG research unit at the time was focused on relativity and comparison and how comparison affects our self perceptions and our thoughts, our behaviors and so on. Um, so I brought with me to Cologne this interest in nostalgia. Um, so I just also wanna take this time to, to thank the DFG for funding this research, research unit. I probably would never have met Joris uh, in this regard um, because you know it, our ideas are were somewhat disparate and we, we were sort of across the ocean and maybe would have never met, but thanks to the DFG, you know, we came together and uh, we're sort of forced into this like creative collaboration that created what I think is sort of a new and interesting um, novel framework. So just gonna just say thanks again for the DFG. I'm still nurturing these collaborations. Several um, uh, research unit folks are joining here in Florida for, for talks uh, in the next semester. Um, so again, thanks so much for that. Uh, it's, it really is a, a, an amazing opportunity for me. So um, yeah, I came to Cologne with this interest in nostalgia and uh, I think, you know, chatted with yours for a bit and we decided to meet up to talk about how our interests might align. Um, Wait, and... tell the story. You have to tell the yeah, story so... about your no, well, about uh, the obituary. Okay. <laughs> well, I got interested in nostalgia because 
Um, I was, uh, so my first year of, as a grad student, there was a memorial service for one of the um, late faculty from Kansas and all of his old students came and they were all sharing stories of like taking his class and, you know, all the discoveries they were making and everything. I, I was feeling nostalgic about this time period that um, I was like, I, I, don't, I wasn't even born, I don't think, um, but I was feeling so nostalgic, like I really wanted to be a part of that. And I just could not let go of that feeling and why I was feeling that. And I really needed to know at that point, like, what, why do we feel this way? What is the purpose? What kind of functions does it serve? So that's how I got interested in nostalgia. And fast forward several years um, to Yoris and I uh, meeting up to talk about these ideas. And ironically, I just thought of this today, Yoris. Ironically, our first meeting, the Germans will understand this and I'll then I have to explain it for the non <laughs> The, the cafe we met in is called Cafe Zainzucht, and Zainzucht is uh, like translated into like a wistful longing. So we went to the cafe wistful longing to talk about wistful longing, which I, I don't think I recognize that until just today. Uh, anyway, so Joris and I um, met up in this cafe to talk about how our interests might align. Um, so Joris, you can go on to the next slide. Yeah, so, so, so our... Uh... Basically, we were then talking about, like, I was talking about my interest in ideology and, and conservative thinking, and, and Matt was talking about his research on, on to nostalgia and looking for the past. And then we sort of had this idea, like, this idea, well, could it be the case that, that conservatives are just more nostalgic? They have a stronger preference for the past. And this was, uh, this is an idea that, that basically, if you if you think about it, you see it in a lot, right? If you see if you just compare these slogans, the left is the, the slogan by uh, Barack Obama for his um, I think his first presidential campaign, and uh, on the right is of course uh, Donald Trump's, and you can see already the the an illustration of this idea, right? That liberals on the left tend to be more forward uh, towards the future, and conservatives have a stronger psychological focus or or whatever you want to call it on the past. Um, and so, um, yeah, basically our thought was then, well, okay, that, that's maybe, maybe that's the case and maybe that's interesting, right? To, to, to have an understanding that uh, conservatives are uh, more nostalgic and liberals maybe less, but um, can we then also sort of um, connect to this, to this idea? Does it, does it mean that if ideas would be presented in a different way than you would usually expect them, namely making perhaps liberal ideas more nostalgic, would then conservatives become more um, more, uh, more interested in those ideas or more receptive. Um, and we were then mainly thinking, for example, of climate change, right? Climate change, you often have this, if, if you, if you read about climate change, um, communication, political communication, it's often about how climate change is going to affect us in the future, right? How it's going to change the future state of the world, but there's little or never uh, a focus on how climate change takes us away from the past. And I thought was maybe, maybe that's, that's would be more appealing. Um, Matt also found this, uh, Matt. Yeah, so I just, yeah, I just want us to, to mention that, you know, this doesn't seem to be sort of just an incidental thing or isolated to campaigns or marketing or even just in the minds of individuals, but we can see it sort of play out on a larger scale. Uh, when we look at some big data. So just side note, there's probably an opportunity here to really get involved in sort of a, a big data approach to understanding the way that language affects politics and ideology. Um, but if you just look at these two maps, so the map on the left is a map of the Cook Partisan Voting Index across the US, where red states are those that tend to vote more um, Republican and blue states are those that tend to vote more um, Democrat. And you know we've all seen this map uh, <laughs> because of recent events, but um, if you take that map and compare it to this one on the right, um, so what I did is I found some Google search data from Google Trends um, for phrases in the past and in the future. So this is just search frequencies for people going online and searching, you know, what was in the past or you know, I don't know how people are searching for those things, but um, basically uh, and on this map, red states are those that search more for in the past and blue states are those that search for uh, more for in the future. And you can see like a pretty considerable overlap there between um, the, the Cook Partisan Voting Index and searches for these different sort of temporal focuses. So we think that there's something sort of ingrained in the sort of way political ideology manifests and the way that people um, understand their experiences um, relative to the past and the future. And that's kind of 
you know, the, the foundation of our research, kind of the basic assumption that we're using um, when we're doing our research. Yeah, so, so what we were doing basically here is um, in this research is, um, well, you have many, many issues um, that we have like almost a fixed way of thinking about those issues in respect to time, right? So if you think back about uh, gun rights in the USA, for example, it's often about like protecting uh, a state that was in the past, right? So it's about the second amendment. And as you can see, like, for example, in this logo, right? There's a strong connection with the past. It's this American uh, Minuteman carrying his musket. And so there's a, there's a strong sort of feeling how, how, how this strong association, right? This issue is presented as uh, a desire to keep something that's in the past. Um, some aspect of the past and I thought it was, well, could we, and this is, this is basically, you could say is a very, um, sort of like a, a social cognitive approach. It's a bit like a, the dominant approach that we like to take is, can we sort of disentangle these issues? Right? So much like, uh, climate change is maybe something that's often presented as a, as a future thing. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, gun rights is something that's, that's presented with the past. Can we sort of disentangle these issues and present them in a different way? So for example, restricting gun ownership, a liberal issue, could you take that tease that apart and sort of merge it onto the past? Right. And if you would do that, if you would present a liberal position, namely to restrict gun, gun ownership. Um, but you make this somehow not somehow more, uh, consistent with the past would then conservatives who normally oppose this, maybe because they would see this as a deviation from the past, would they become more accepting of the issue? Because, you know, no, so, uh, no longer is it so, so inconsistent with the past. And so that's basically the, the, the general approach that we took in this study, uh, in this line of research, uh, Matt. Yeah. So. How, how do we um, actually study this? So um, kind of a, a, the basic paradigm that you'll kind of get familiar with as we go through this. Essentially what we do is we ask for participants to uh, come into the lab, which um, you'll see in a second is really just an online space. Um, and we present them a, a message. Uh, in this study, it's a sort of pro gun control message. Um, and uh, so for example, it might say something like, you know, people may own hunting rifles and pistols, but no one will have assault rifles. So this is someone who's saying, I wish for a time where people can own hunting rifles, pistols, but no one will have assault rifles. Um, but then we, we show half of the participants in our study sort of an extra message that's future framed, right? So I would like to make this change so that in the near future, the ownership of weapons will be more limited. And then the other half participants get a different message. And that message is past focused that says something like, I'd like to go back to the old days where the ownership of weapons was more limited. So here the message is exactly the same. It's about gun control, but we just stylize it in a way that may appeal more to one side or the other. So when the message is future framed, which we think is kind of the, you know, the default progressive message, um, you can see that liberals and conservatives are pretty far apart on their endorsement or agreement with that message. So conservatives are sort of in, uh, disagreeing more and liberals are agreeing more, but when we show participants the past frame, um, we're able to sort of reduce that um, disagreement by quite a lot. And now you see that the conservatives, the little red person there, is on the, the, the right side of the midpoint, which essentially moves them from a disagreeing per perspective to an agreeing perspective. And um, mm -hmm. the, the left and the right now um, are sort of more close together. Um, so this is kind of like the, the first little hint at at how the the style of the message matters more than the content maybe or, or at least in part yeah so so i mean to be clear right these these are like i mean obviously we use more than two uh, people right this is just sort of like the the average we also would measure ideology more on a sliding scale um, um these are sort of the the um, the means in a regression um uh, so, so how did we do this kind of research? Um, so, as, as Matt already alluded, like we, we we don't have people in the lab. We do this research these days on online. Um, so it's it's a very um, effective way of doing research for us. We have these these various services, and what they essentially do is they link researchers to uh, participants in this research. And so participants are paid something like a dollar or so for five minutes of their time, in which they participate in this. In this research online, and this is, has very uh, many many advantages for us. 
And the biggest uh, advantage is essentially that we have now easy access to um, large numbers of relatively representative samples. Right? So in the past, we often would do our research with uh, with student samples. We would have uh, undergrads or so take part in research or other students. And this has, of course, many disadvantages. The biggest one is that um, yeah, these are students, so they are not representative at all. Um, in political psychology, this is, of course, even a bigger issue, right? Because we want to make a, um, a statement or we want to do research about like people in general. Um, and so, uh, yeah, this is, this is a really, um, a great, a great, great, um, um, innovation for us uh, these, days, these days to do this. It also allows us to like rule out uh, various alternative explanations. We have a very sort of uh, sample, of course, that's that's not that has less uh, that's less likely to guess our hypothesis, right? I mean, psychology students are of course often more sort of like interested in trying to find out what's going on or so, and have uh, more uh, knowledge. And so that's 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 all a big problem. And so with this online research, that's really uh, that's really great. Um, yeah, I can hop in. I just just to add to that too. Um, so I think most of the data that we present today is is from the USA. But in this in this paper in this work that we've done, we've also used these online tools to collect data from from Germany and the UK as well. So one of the other advantages is to, to sort of understand how these um, things play out, you know, cross culturally, cross nationally. Um, and again, having this sort of international collaboration makes that just so much easier as, as far as translating materials or just having access to um, different samples and populations. Um, it's so important for our science to have that. Um, mm -hmm. So these tools, plus the funding for things like um, these international collaborations um, is just really crucial as we go forward as a psychological science. So that's just kind of my welcome to my TED talk. Um, so uh, this is one of my favorite studies. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to um, introduce it and then yours, you can talk about the data, I guess. But um, so in this study, we're looking at the issue of diversity is specifically like a pro diversity message. So I found this comic um, from DC Comics. This is a real comic. Um, it originally was published on a um, book cover in 1949. You know, students can get like paper book covers to cover their books for school back in the day. I don't know if they do that still. But anyway, this comic was published on a book cover in 1949. And here you see Superman talking to a group of students and Superman says, remember boys and girls, your school like our country is made up of Americans of many different races, religions and national origins. So if you hear anyone talk against a schoolmate or anyone else because of his religion, race or national origin, don't wait, tell him that kind of talk is un-American. So I think today we would consider this like a really progressive message. Some might even react against it as sort of politically correct or something like this. Um, but what's great about this study is that this is a, an actual message from 1949. Um, so what we did in this study is we showed participants this comic and we told some people that this is a real vintage comic from, from the 50s um, that was used uh, on, yeah, sort of a, a, a school book cover. Um, and then we told another half of participants that this is a sort of modern day message that's been like retooled to look vintage. So one is like a real past focused comic and the other is a more present day comic um, made to look uh, vintage. And so um, again, what we're showing you here on this uh, part of the slide is um, when the comic is framed as sort of a modern day message, liberals and conservatives don't agree on the content of that message. So conservatives tend to sort of disagree more with this pro-diversity message. But when we remind people that this is a real vintage comic from the 50s, we reduce that disagreement by quite a lot. And again, now conservatives are a little more open to agreeing with that message. I should say at this point, I, I wanna say at this point that um, we're not saying that it's sort of, you know, uh, you know, stupid conservatives or mindless conservatives who um, should, you know, should be better at, at um, you know, reading into these messages. Um, it, in fact, it's sort of the responsibility of both parties. You know, one might even say that if, if, the, if this is a progressive message, um, it should be up to the progressive party to understand the other side in, in a way that that makes their communication more effective, right? So it's just like marketing. So in a way, it's it's up to the audience trying to get the message across, or the the party trying to get the message across, to frame that message in a way that 
um, essentially is able to reach across the aisle. So we're not uh, making any sort of value statements about like who's right or who's wrong or whose responsibility it is. We're simply just saying that agreement can come when the framing is um, targeted in, in a way that sort of respects some differences and tries to bring people to the same page. Yeah, we also, this study is interesting also because we, we were able to sort of establish uh, with, with psychological tools, you can sort of establish the, the thoughts that people have um, when reading this. And we were also able to show in this study that it's really like the, the, the feeling of nostalgia that, that basically psychologically uh, acts as the, as the process variable, meaning like people who, in particular, people who feel this strong sense of nostalgia when seeing such a picture uh, in the past, uh, they really endorse the message. So it sort of hints at this um, psychological process. Um, another, another, actually, maybe you want to explain this one too, Matt. Sure, I can do Given that. that. You conducted this one. Yeah, sure. Why not? Um, yeah, so uh, we, you know, we tackled a lot of issues in this uh, big package, but um, uh, the, the original studies we conducted were really focused on climate change. We thought that was sort of the pressing issue at the time. Um, so here I'm just going to talk about how um, we can we can also uh, at least from this particular study show that that we can drive behaviors also that um, sort of support one of these messages or the other. So in this study we created two fake pro environmental charities. So we have here World Keepers Foundation, which is creating a new Earth for the future, and we have Wild Earth Incorporated, which is restoring the planet to its original state. And we simply showed participants these two. Uh, one version of these of these charities, and we said, you know, here's 50 cents. How much of that 50 cents would you want to give to one or the other? So choose how to allocate this money as a donation to these two charities. Um, and I just want to focus on the the furthest left bar in the graph first. Um, this is Liberals' donations to the World Keepers Foundation, which is the future focused charity. You can see they're giving more to this uh, future focused charity. And you move all the way over to the right to that um, that white bar there on the conservative side. Conservatives give the same amount of money, but to the Wild Earth Incorporated, right? So again, we're showing that um, probably on these sort of typically progressive issues, liberals and conservatives may be equally willing to endorse those messages, to act in ways that are supportive of those policies, um, but only when the framing is matching sort of that particular worldview or is, is um, being used in a way that helps um, each side sort of make sense of that message. Yeah, so you, you mentioned pressing issues, uh, right? Of course, uh, climate change is an extremely pressing issue. Another extremely pressing issue at the moment, or like, uh, is, is of course the the Corona crisis and our response to it, and so in in that light, uh, my my grad student uh, Anna Schulte uh, and and Matt and me we also conducted a study recently where we and that's exactly the stimuli that you saw just now we um, we uh, presented these stimuli and um, well by now you should have a sense like what our prediction and the results were. Um, wait, I can now show the poll. Um, uh, as you should see the poll by now. So we found, we asked this, this essentially, um, as you can see, your your preference is sort of, um, is sort of uh, equally divided. And half and half. Rough, half, half, thanks. Um, which actually is is, is an interesting result and, and a good result, right? So it, it suggests that um, this message can be persuasively presented in either way. Uh, and as you probably would have, will, will have guessed by now, what, what we found is that um, there was a correlation or a tendency for conservatives to prefer the one on the left uh, better. So if we would we show the, the, the one on the right, which is of course extremely future focused, it's just futuristic face mask. Um, conservatives in particular did not, uh, were not, were, were a bit sort of didn't really like the message. Um, of course, in general, in, in American politics, politics at the moment, there is this uh, stronger preference among conservatives or a stronger opposition to face mask wearing. Um, and we, we found that also in this condition. But if we instead present this uh, picture on the left, which is an actual picture taken from uh, the 19, what is it, 1917 uh, uh, Spanish flu, um, you see uh, that we, we found that this liberal conservative disagreement was reduced by about a third. So you see that that's not as strong a result as in the other studies. Um, there's still quite some opposition here. But um, you also have to 
I take into account that this is extremely politicized message at the moment. That's that's quite with very entrenched uh, perspectives, right? And so, like a simple picture to present a different present this issue in a different way can nonetheless uh, reduce this uh, this opposition by quite a bit. Um, so, so to sort of summarize um, our findings or to to to, to discuss these findings. Um, we think that the political debate, as we understand it. Oh, sorry, I was muted for a sec. Um, we tend to see the political debate as strongly a debate over content, right? And that we, we have this idea, liberals and conservatives, they disagree about content, and that's the only thing uh, that's going on. And we think, based on these results and other findings, that it's also, in a way, a hidden debate, a debate about style or presentation, about language, essentially. And um, this doesn't mean that we think that ideology, um, that this is sort of like an irrational thing. You can see ideology is sort of like a, a set of hidden preferences and assumptions. Liberals and conservatives have different, have different hidden preferences, um, have di different likes and dislikes. And, and this is very much also reasonable. This comes back a bit to this point I made earlier about Burke and about like how society grows. And I, th I think it, it, there's, speaking as a, as a mild liberal, I think there's also a lot to be said about taking, uh, taking, uh, taking the past into account and having a preference, a preference for sort of building society in a sort of more incremental manner, uh, Matt. What, uh, I mean, you can you can keep going through the, oh, sorry. <laughs> the discussion if you want to. I mean, I don't need to so, take over so, unless so, you really want me to. Right, right. So, so, um, so, I, I, what my what my perspective, what our perspective here is, is like a sort of it sort of makes sense to to uh, to test and 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 uh, try to sort of map these these hidden preferences. And this is not sort of, we, we don't see this as a way to sort of trick conservatives into, you know, uh, agreeing with a liberal perspective or so. Uh, instead, we, we think it's really, it's about respecting differences, right? Because if we, if we sort of understand these, these um, hidden preferences and we can appeal to it, we can arrive at a more civil, respectful uh, debate. And a debate, a political debate, not just in politics, not just in parliament itself, but also, uh, in in outside there can then be more sort of more pragmatic people are more likely to agree with each other and I mean, this is also a bit sort of the the, the message and the and the and the, and the, um, the, the um the goal that e contribute which is the cluster of excellence here at the university of cologne and bonn does um so what is what is uh cluster of excellence excellence seeks to do is it combines researchers in, in economics law politics psychology social sciences to sort of um um move beyond a a well essentially like if you think about the political debate as a marketplace where people exchange ideas and uh try to convince each other and and thus reach a sort of like more efficient rational uh better, higher form of understanding. Th that's a very great way of seeing this, but it requires a marketplace of ideas. It requires people to freely, openly discuss and also change their minds. And if instead, like the political, the political arena is more like an entrenched uh, battlefield where people just don't leave their positions and never agree with each other, right? then this sort of efficiency is gone. You don't have this exchange of ideas. Right? And so we, we see our research really in sort of this perspective that we want to um, stimulate this to get at a at, at more uh, at a more stronger exchange, and I want to to draw your attention to our website, which has very interesting uh, discussion papers and also a very nice uh, podcast uh, in German, though the Wirtschaft podcast. Um, but um, yeah, I think a sort of this respect for differences is also good because it it avoids these 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 costs of an over partisan society, society that is too entrenched. And I think like the the recent Corona uh, virus and how, in, in particular in America demonstrated the risks and the costs of an over entrenched society, right? So what we here see is uh, tendencies among Republicans and Democrats to to worry about Corona and then also to behave consistent with this worry. And you see that this that this health uh, issue has become an overly uh, polit politicized and polarized debate, right? Which also um, shaped how people uh, behaved. And I mean, that's clearly a, a health cost and a cost to society. Um, now, so, so how, how can we use this, right? How can we use this, this type of knowledge 
to um, to be better communicators, to communicate more effectively towards people with different political opinion. Well, I think what's very important here is that, and this is not just only our research, this is like a whole, whole uh, body of research, is that facts alone and, and, and objective facts, they are not the best to convince your opponents. Um, what instead works much better is to, if, you, if you seek to appeal to others' worldviews and also shared worldviews, right? And so I think our research really shows like others' worldviews in the sense like, like preferences about time, uh, ideas about time. Um, they are very effective. Um, and for example, like, like so we, we showed this research about time and how this can help in, uh, in the climate change debate, but there's other research. For example, we know that conservatives have a stronger um, tendency to a stronger um, sensitivity to sort of disgusting, disgusting uh, stimuli. I just saw Jonathan Haidt being mentioned in the chat. Uh, he has shown this. And so, for example, research by uh, Feinberg and Wheeler shows that, that, that if you use stimuli like that, which sort of really appeal to the to sort of discuss, this is a very effective way to also communicate the issue of climate change and, and pollution in general, right? So if pollution becomes something that's disgusting, conservatives are much more inclined to agree with that. Um, and so another way to do this is to bridge conflict is by sort of expressing personal experiences. And I think that's also like a, a broader way at looking at our research. Right? So why is the, the past so, um, so sort of convincing. Well, one thing is that I think conservatives sort of have a preference for the past, but another thing to it is also that like, if I say I want to have more diversity because it, it reminds me, it brings me back to, to my childhood or to some element of the past, right? And it's a very personal, a very sincere, a very honest sort of way of, of, of uh, bringing this, this issue, right? And like, if if you would if you um, present your perspective on something by by appealing to some other aspect of your youth, like who am I then to sort of disagree with that, right? I mean, if this is your if this is your perspective on the past, if these are your memories, then that's a then that's a very difficult to argue with, right? And so that's this, this is a graphic taken from research by Emily Kubin, who uh, uh, is now in Germany, actually working at American grad student, um, in uh, recently published in PNES. Um, that also sort of that sort of illustrates this point, right? So like, if you talk about facts, that that that's 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 difficult to convince. But if you then speak about personal experiences, uh, you're seen as much more rational um, uh, because it's sort of connecting more strongly with the truth, and this sort of leads to respect and a willingness to interact. And so I think that's that's really important if we talk about like how to convince our opponents. Like we have an automatic tendency to stay with our own motives, our own perspectives, our own uh, values, and we forget that in convincing others, it's much more important to appeal to, to, appeal to others, emotions, values, etc. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Um, I think I should close the... If you want to close the, the presentation, that'd be great, and then you can go to a, a view where you can see all the participants or the, uh, the audience as well, which is great. So thank you so much for this incredibly inspiring talk. Also, thank you for making us work a little bit to think about our own position uh, quite a bit. And as you can see, the chat was basically exploding. I'm trying to keep an eye on the chat and listening to you and make sure that we uh, get all the questions in here today. But I also want to let the, the audience know that um, Matt and yours have agreed to take a few questions afterwards and actually reply to them in some sort of social media. So we'll, we'll take some of the questions and actually post them and post the answers. So, because I think we're not going to get through uh, with all of them today. Since I'm the moderator, of course, I always have the luxury of asking the first question, which I will take very much advantage of. And it's a very brief one, basically. So you talk a lot about the, the temporal side of of um, how opinions differ, how you, you tend to be more liberal or tend to be more uh, conservative in a way. How much does age play a role? Because I think in terms of nostalgia, right? I have, of course, more nostalgia the older I get. So if you could briefly answer to that, maybe. Matt, I think you're the expert. Sure, yeah. So um, there's, there's an interesting um, thing where, um, Definitely, the you you sort of need time to be nostalgic about something. 
And there's some data suggesting that people tend to get nostalgic, um, you know, some years after what we call the, the, like the reminiscence bump. So there's a reminiscence bump where sort of people start to get more reminiscent about their childhood and often it, it sort of matches up with sort of this adolescent growth period. So there probably is sort of like a window of time um, where there's sort of heightened nostalgia at, at that age. Um, that being said, there's also research suggesting that um, people kind of across the age spectrum are nostalgic about um, both times that they were alive and times that they weren't. So there is sort of this idea of vicarious nostalgia or virtual nostalgia, historical nostalgia. It's been called like many different things, but you know, you might think about like the hipster culture that sort of nostalgizes kind of old vintage clothing or vinyl records or time periods for which people weren't alive. So I think there's an age effect on nostalgia maybe generally, but I think that it's not a strong factor all the time. Um, typically in our studies, we control for age, like statistically control for age to make sure that, um, that it's not simply the older um, demographic in our samples that sort of drive the effect. Um, so, so I think age, you know, sort of plays a role in nostalgia, um, but, but we don't think it explains the entire effect that we find. Okay, and that actually ties into two questions that we got from the audience as well. So there is one from um, Soren Harst, and he says, could you talk about your ideas where differences nostalgia come from? How does it relate to other personality traits that differ between liberals and conservatives? And then there's also a question about, does it make a difference what cultural background you have? So I wonder how and if the nostalgic concept can be applied to non-white uh, American populations. This is coming from Petra. Sure. Um, great question. Thank you. So, um, so there, there hasn't been a whole lot of research looking at the sort of personality underpinnings of nostalgia. So, you know, typically the researchers in the nostalgia field are interested in um, producing a feeling of nostalgia in a person um, or not, and then seeing what that feeling does for their self perception and so on. Um, there are some links to personality, but similar to the question about age. I think it's like not a strong as strong a factor. Um, I think that probably nostalgia is an indi individual difference that isn't as closely tied to personality as maybe one would think. Um, I think something like the cultural background question is probably more salient. Um, so there is some early research from um, uh, Janelle Wilson on kind of the sociology of nostalgia. And um, there was a there was a, a chapter in that book on sort of the nostalgia of older African American adults, right? Because you might wonder what kind of nostalgia does an older African American adult have, given the history. Um, and in fact, um, those adults that were that were interviewed do feel nostalgic about the past, but the content of that nostalgia is really unique. Um, so I think um, it's probably more important. And this there's some research kind of going on on this right now to not think about nostalgia so much as something that people have or don't have or that varies individually, but rather um, look at the content of people's nostalgia and what kinds of things people are afforded being nostalgic about. So in this particular case, the African-Americans in that in that chapter were nostalgic about you know, strong community, um, also many stories about like sneaking into the all white drive-in movie theater and kind of sticking it to the man. Um, so there were lots of nostalgic stories, but of course, you know, very unique to that particular culture. And, and you know, there just hasn't been, you know, the nostalgia research is still a little bit in its infancy. And there hasn't been a whole lot of that kind of cross-cultural comparison or like looking at these specific demographics. But I do grant that um, definitely given your background or your demographics or your class or whatever, um, certain people may be afforded more or less nostalgia than others. Um, and the content of that nostalgia would surely be an interesting variable to look at and how that might predict some of these outcomes that we are studying in our research. That's great. I think with an eye on the time, we have time for maybe two more questions. And please also feel free to raise your hand if you want to ask a question in person. Otherwise, I'll just keep going through the chat a little bit and try to also condense uh, what you've 
what you've put in there. And I think um, one of the questions that comes up in, in various different shapes and forms is really about your research. Um, it's two questions actually. One is the definition of liberal and conservative in the different contexts, right? It's different in Germany than it is in, in the United States. And also I think the most burning question is how does it work the other way around? So we heard a lot about, you know, conservatives being more prone to nostalgic uh, elements, but, but does it work the other way around as well? Because I think we all feel somehow nostalgic, whether we're liberal or conservative, but how do you sway the other way around and, and how does it, how does that get reflected in your work? Hmm. So, so, yeah, it's definitely true that, um, I mean, this is, this is also one reason why we focused on, uh, America in most of our studies is like a, a two party system is of course, um, is has many disadvantages, but for a researcher, it has many advantages. Namely, it makes it much easier, right? You have just have a, well, you do not, you, you have a, a largely, uh, a simple preference for one party over the other. Right, so it's 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 a single dimension. I mean, of course, there are also other dimensions even in American politics, but they tend to sort of um, be be conflated, right, or become uh, it, it sort of all falls into this single dimension. Now, in America, in, in Germany, of course, and in, in other uh, continental European systems, it's it's much more difficult, and so we also use more complex measures of ideology, uh, multi dimensions. We ask about people's preference about uh, political issues, for example. So it's definitely true. We do find though in, in Germany the same uh, the same effects, and also in in Britain, we haven't done any other countries than those. I mean, I really would love. I'm actually setting up research now in in Turkey, which would be very interesting because I think Turkey is a particularly interesting example, because many countries in the West have I I think you could say have slowly over the past decades moved to a more liberal. Um, a liberal position on many things, right? Like I say, on 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 uh, traditional um, of, um, marriage or uh, gay rights or so, right? Have, have, have become more liberal. And Turkey is an example of, of a country that in recent years has moved quite sharply back to a to a more conservative cultural conservative perspective. And so, my my question is: Can would would conservatives in Turkey also be? Uh, nostalgic for a recent past, a past that's in a way many in many ways more liberal than than the present, right? And so that would be a very interesting test of our hypothesis. Um, but I've drifted away. Now is the second question. Uh, yeah, the yeah. second question was basically if you can can sway opinion also in the other direction more towards the liberal uh, way of thinking. Like, how would you do that? So I so we did try. So in in one of the studies we tried. Um, kind of flipping the the script, so we tried presenting a conservative message with a future focus, um, uh, but it, that didn't work. Um, so we, you know, we kind of have balked at that at this point. We may return to it, but my thought was that, you know, there may be sort of differences in the value that liberals and conservatives place on that temporal focus, right? So conservatives value the past, kind of full stop, because that's where kind of the the, um, you know, the value lies in the things that we did back then, the traditions, et cetera. So there's sort of an inherent value there. For liberals, I don't think the future holds inherent value. I think the future is like an open place where you can project ideals. So I think that just framing something as a future focus for a liberal doesn't make them value it because it's future focused. It still needs to match the ideal that's sort of projected into the future. So. That, that would be my answer to that. So at least just like flipping it around probably wouldn't work. That being said, there's some recent research showing that liberals are nostalgic about say like the Obama era, um, especially given what's happened more recently. So there's probably something kind of specific about depending on how things are going now, I might be nostalgic for some particular time period um, that represents maybe how I would like it to be or what I think represents kind of the true you know, the best morally good way for it to be. And so as long as you can find that kind of connection and then frame a message using that, um, it may work, but, but I just, yeah, we haven't done that research, so I don't really know. Yeah. I mean, there's also another reason why it couldn't work. I mean, so if, if you say I have a policy proposal to make some change, uh, and this is going to affect the future, I mean, any policy, of course, and now just due to the loss of, of nature, right? Physics. I mean, everything is going to affect the future. And so like appealing to like mentioning the future by itself 
uh, may not even be noticed, right? So it, it could be that liberals do have a focus on the future, but merely mentioning it doesn't sort of highlight it. Like if you if you say, okay, this is going to bring us back to the past, or we're going to bring back an element of the past, I mean that might be might easily grab attention, right? Hey, that's that's something I didn't know, I didn't think about, right? But the future does not have that so so easily. So that, that could be why it's sort of the effect is hidden if it's there. This is absolutely fascinating. I would love uh, to continue uh, much, much longer because there are many, many open questions. And I'm also wondering if your research will actually change now as we go into the future with all the different challenges that we're facing, right? Because our future is very uncertain. Uh, it's less and less predictable and it's becoming more and more complex. So it's, it's, I'm curious to see if we actually merge more towards the middle, all of us. And for sure, I myself will definitely look at myself differently uh, again as well and wonder, am I more conservative or more liberal in my decisions that I'm making? So this is uh, fantastic. Thank you very, very much for giving us this super insight and these great perspectives. And again, a big, big thank you to all the organizers and partners and also to the audience. I saw somebody joining us from a car, which is amazing. I hope you stopped somewhere and listened to us that weren't driving. And um, I'm very much looking forward, I think, together with all the partners to seeing you again for our next adventure and next discussion and thank you again to yours and matthew this was um fantastic insights and let's all be more i don't know more alert and uh, towards what's happening outside and also inside of us thank you very much for joining us